Great. Hello, and thanks to all of you for tuning into our program today on the future of reproductive rights in America. I'm Andrea Grossman, the founder of Writer's Block, now in our 26th season. I'm so grateful to the Beverly Hills Bar Association for co-hosting several events together, especially during the pandemic. As Belinda McCauley, the fabulous executive director of the Beverly Hills Bar, and I wrung our hands about the future of reproductive rights, we knew we had to put our heads together and come up with a decisively informative program of what we, what we here on the ground can do. Today, we'll, we'll give you answers. Legal scholar Michelle Goodwin, whose recent guest column in the New York Times on being raped by her father, was one of the most powerful essays I've read in years. Belinda added another layer of authority to the program when she asked Alexis McGill Johnson, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and she created an event even more profoundly packed with expertise and wisdom. And then Belinda brought in journalist Jessica Piclo to steer this ship. I'm so proud and honored for Writer's Block to be part of this today. Here's Belinda to put our program into context and to introduce our participants. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Andrea and Writer's Block Presents, and to everyone for attending tonight. As Andrea said, I'm Belinda McCauley, Executive Director of the Beverly Hills Bar Association, and I'm particularly honored to be introducing tonight's speakers. Earlier in my career, I spent five years as an attorney at NARAL Pro-Choice America. I worked alongside Planned Parenthood's talented and dedicated attorneys during the start of an ominous period in anti-choice states in particular. This was more than 15 years ago, but the groundwork was being laid for what's happening today. I'm so looking forward to hearing from the experts this evening about this especially perilous moment in time for the right to privacy. Planned Parenthood needs no introduction with this audience and its leader probably doesn't either, but I can't help but give a quick overview of the professional background that makes her such an ideal president. Alexis McGill Johnson took the helm of Planned Parenthood two years ago at a tumultuous time for the organization and for reproductive justice. She brought with her a wealth of expertise from her political organizing and academic careers, which included having taught political science and African-American studies at both Yale and Wesleyan universities and serving as political director of Hip Hop Summit Action Network and executive director of Citizen Change and of the Perception Institute, the latter a research group she founded that studies bias reduction and discrimination. She has brought intersectionality and frank discussions of racial disparities to Planned Parenthood's leadership and is a compelling defender of healthcare access and of reproductive rights. Professor Michelle Bratcher Goodwin is a Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine, <clears throat> where she's also the founding director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. She's a renowned legal expert, a prolific author who is among the most cited law professors in the nation and a regular commentator in media. She's credited with helping to establish and shape the health law field. She's also written movingly about her personal experience with rape and abortion, including in the New York Times piece that Andrea referenced. Her combination of professional and personal understanding of these issues and her analysis of the legal and policy underpinnings of health law will provide essential context to tonight's conversation. There's likely no journalist in America who spends more time tracking and reporting on reproductive rights and justice than Jessica Mason Piclo. As senior VP and executive editor, she oversees the day-to-day -day editorial content at Rewire, which is the only national publication exclusively dedicated to reporting on reproductive and sexual health rights and justice. Jessica had a successful career as a litigator before moving into media, and she's co-authored two books on abortion rights in the courts. She speaks regularly on these issues, including on her popular podcast with the fantastic Imani Gandhi, Boom, Lawyered. I'm grateful she agreed to guide tonight's conversation. Jessica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction and this and organizing this amazing conversation. This is truly a thrill and an honor and could not be more important and more timely. So let me set the table real quickly for those of you who are choosing to spend your time with us tonight and thank you for doing so. This is really going to be quite a thrill. I appreciate that you may not you all may not spend as much time mired in the morass of abortion rights as access as, as we do on this panel here. So let me give you a little bit of 
of a look into what the state of access is in this country. We have Texas's SB8. It's a law that bans abortion as soon as fetal heart tones are detected. And that can happen as early as six weeks in a pregnancy. That has been in effect for almost six months and counting now. That particular bill is something new and unusual and very dangerous. We'll talk about it. Um, it has and the ability to, for third parties, folks who are just regular folks out there in the world to launch objections and to try and block folks' abortion access. And this we're starting to see ripple into other areas of the law as well. Texas, unfortunately, is inspiring some copycat legislation with similar bills moving in states like Alabama and Idaho and gerrymandered states, which we'll also talk about in this program. We're waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on a challenge to a Mississippi law that would ban abortion at 15 weeks. This has been an invitation for the conservatives on the court to overturn Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey entirely, which would potentially send abortion back to the states if they were to make good on, on that invitation. We'll talk a little bit about that. So far, the federal response has been a little tepid, I would say, as a journalist here. We see the Biden administration trying to make strides and, and members of Congress as well. But, you know, those, those efforts are in progress. And so I, I hope that we talk about that as well. It's not all bad news, though. States are pushing back, and there is momentum around this issue now, particularly as folks understand the seriousness of what's at risk. States like Vermont and Maryland are pushing forward with co proposed constitutional amendments that would protect abortion rights and access. California itself is leading the charge, looking to become a sanctuary and oasis for folks who need reproductive care. So these are all silver linings in a storm Stormy, stormy forecast for abortion rights at the moment. But now that I've given you a little snapshot, let's really get into it because we have two of the leading experts on this issue and quite frankly, two women who have done more to advance the cause of abortion rights and access than I can think of. So Alexis, I'm gonna start with you because I just outlined some of what's going on right now. And as Belinda suggested in her introduction, the political attacks on abortion rights and access are not new. They've been going on for many, many years, but definitely, we're seeing an amplification right now, particularly in some of the gerrymandered states that I that I mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about this increasing wave of abortion bans at the state level and why in particular we're seeing them reach the apex that we are right now? Yeah, absolutely. So first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm just delighted to be in this conversation with both of you um, at such a critical time. I mean, like literally next week, we're we're looking at the 15-week ban in Florida, Arizona, also passing a 15-week ban. We have the Supreme Court, you know, taking up, uh, you know, um, a 15-week bill in um, in uh, Mississippi that literally will um, undermine, you know, unravel all of of what we know to be codified under Roe. Um, and at the same time, to your point, we have um, a lot of work that we have to do to push back, but we know this did not happen overnight, right? Or just even in the last four years. This is really, and it's so important, I think, to situate, this is really about the last decade of power grabs, right? The weaponizing of rules changes, of gerrymandering, of court packing, of um, at, at every opportunity, seeing the opposition really seize these levers, levers of power in order to, to, um, to drive um, a different conversation. And there's this disconnect, right? Where we see the public opinion data. We know that there is literally no state that is um, where banning abortion is popular. People want to be able to make decisions. Uh, they don't want state law, lawmakers to make them. And yet, and still we see the, the consolidation of power be completely at opposition because so many of these legislatures that, that got swept up in the you know, 2010 um, uh, Congress that were able to basically um, consolidate power at that level. And you know, I do think that uh, the structures and the systems that have been able to drive these things using state legislatures as laboratories using the ability to kind of um, even test things like this private right of action uh, in Lubbock in advance of, um, of what we saw in SB8. Those are the strategies that have been, um, you know, I think really uh, 
folks have been emboldened, I would say, um, under the last uh, administration and, um, and leader while they were watching the courts change. So that is, I think, part of why we are here in this particular moment, not to mention the Supreme Court, which I know we'll get to at another, another point or many points tonight. Um, but I think we just really have to look at this very systematically and how they've actually built these structures and systems in order to pass these laws. That's such a smart and important um, point because, as you know, not only as we said, it's not overnight, but it is also not an isolated incident, right? These are all connected. So the political gerrymandering absolutely goes hand in hand with abortion bans, goes hand in hand with restriction on voting rights, and we we see the same cast of characters. Professor Gwen, this is your life's work. This is really connecting these dots, the area that you have really um, sh have really shined. And I want to talk to you about some of the impact of the laws that we're that are on the books right now. So I mentioned we're nearly six months into the most restrictive abortion ban in this country being on the books, and we're we're hearing stories out of Texas and the neighboring states of patients having to travel great distances to get care of providers traveling out of state to provide care, you know, but the reality of these bans is that they're actually much more insidious than just blocking immediate access to abortion. And your work, particularly policing the womb, really details how abortion bans are connected to policing in this country. And I'm hoping you can connect some of those dots for us on this call because it's just so important. Thank you so much for the question. And uh, I too uh, thank the organizers for inviting me this evening. It's a great question because we often overlook the historical vestiges that lead us to the moment that we're in. So we can tell multiple stories about how we got here. One important story is the 2010 through 2013 period. Uh, both in terms of shaping a kind of power grab in the United States Congress that was very likely in direct response to the president, Barack Obama, at least there was a part of that. But then also at the state level, we saw that kind of galvanizing and organizing. We could tell a story that dates back about a century that dates to Buck v. Bell, a time in which our country before the Nazis in Germany had a clue about eugenics and doing some of the horrific types of experimentation and also the denying of civil liberties and civil rights there uh, based on an individual's background being Jewish or otherwise, that we were doing things like that in the United States. Here I'm talking about compulsory sterilization, the United States Supreme Court taking up a case in 1927, Buck v. Bell, uh, basically um, affirming um, and allowing to stand a Virginia law that provided for the coercive forced sterilization of people that the state thought to be unfit. A very interesting twist in thinking about white supremacy as being part of this legacy, because there we see white supremacy, white supremacy within whiteness, um, because the state of Virginia was trying to literally rid the future of poor white people in its state and white people that it found to be not fitting with the future for Virginia and the United States Supreme Court upholding that in Buck v. Bell, a tragic case that involved a 16 year old white girl who was poor, had been raped and became pregnant. And Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court uh, said three generations of imbeciles are enough, better than to let them starve for their imbecility. Society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. And in a very interesting nod, as we think about COVID and pandemic, he said that the uh, laws that provide for compulsory vaccination are broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. And so we could talk about 2010 through 2013. We could talk about a century ago with our United States Supreme Court setting the foundation that globally sanctioned eugenics. Um, or we could take it even further and think about a kind of policing that was part of the foundation of what became the United States of America, denying the autonomy and privacy and reproductive liberty uh, to Black women in this country and using their reproduction as part of a move for capitalism and power. And when you think about the Texas law that you referenced, 
it's worth noting that its nefarious and egregious aspects actually take us back to elements of that. If, for example, it calls for the incentivizing of people who would essentially be bounty hunters, as Justice Sotomayor called it, and she's right on point. The federal government during the time of American slavery, chattel slavery, uh, provided for bounties for individuals who would go and hunt down, spy upon Black people who were living in cities where they would be free, either born into freedom, imagine even having to say people born into freedom, or people who had purchased their way into freedom, or who through the dignity of understanding that they were human beings made their way to freedom. And we see aspects of this that are baked into this very law that provides for civil litigation against people who aid and abet individuals with being able to do something that is constitutionally protected, which is being able to terminate a pregnancy. Now, I want to just add two more points before uh, I turn it back over to you, Jessica, and that is, um, you know, what this does at the end of the day also takes us back to a time 2010 through 2013, because as uh, was just mentioned so importantly, um, that voter suppression is connected to this. Um, and also the um, egregious ways in which we saw individuals who are non-documented being uh, surveilled comes out of the same kind of space. And if you look back 100 years ago, it's this kind of chilling aspect, this kind of um, instantiating fear in individuals. And we see that within the space. One of the things that um, hurts my heart deeply about this Texas law and all of what we are seeing is what does it mean for the child who's been sexually assaulted, raped, and who wants to be able to tell her mother, her aunt, uh, the trusted friend, but who fears that, oh, there is this law in Texas that people can get in trouble if they aid and abet you. And because the law is written so broadly, as so many have said, what does aid and abet mean? It means virtually anything that hovers around, um, providing care, assistance, thoughts, <laughs> who knows, to people who want to be able to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and it is so anti-democratic. Uh, it really is. And I'll just end it with that. Ending on that anti-democratic point, especially, I think is so just true. And thank you both for immediately setting the stage of the connections between efforts to roll back reproductive autonomy and the link to power and control of our democracy because they are completely intertwined. And I can't think of a better way to start this, this conversation. We don't even need the Supreme Court to act yet in the Mississippi case and already things are this dire. So Alexis, let me turn this back to you because we are seeing some efforts to protect abortion rights. Uh, you know, um, I've mentioned some of the state ones and, and I mentioned some, acts, some um, actions in Congress. In particular, we have the Women's Health Protection Act, which is a federal piece of legislation that would codify Roe versus Wade. It would essentially say that there is a fundamental right to abortion in all 50 states. So that is good news. How can we push our lawmakers on this? And can we get them to do more? Yeah, I mean, look, the Women's Health Protection Act, I think, has been a, a great uh, beacon for organizers to really mm -hmm. kind of help us, you know, in a, in a moment where, you know, for the for the last decade, as Michelle pointed out, the, the courts um, have shifted and, you know, the courts had been our backstop, right, yeah. um, as, a, as a way to stop some of these um, bad, um, these bans, these, these targeted um, laws against um, against abortion providers in particular, but how they've expanded to now, you know, as we see entrap, you know, other folks who, um, you know, who just would be supporting someone gaining access. And so the ways in which they've shifted this law, the Women's Health Protection Act would establish a statutory right to provide and receive abortion. So a ban like Texas and a ban, you know, that exists in Mississippi would be illegal. Um, we, we don't have the vote. So just to be clear in the Senate as things stand, um, 
but we do have a lot of momentum, I think, in this moment. We do have an opportunity when, um, again, we we are waiting for the court to come back with a decision um, in Jehu, and we also have this the state legislative season, you know, in full effect, where we're seeing all of these bills move forward. And so, the call to Congress right now to say it is time to bring uh, the Women's Health Protection Act, which has already passed the House, to the Senate, and to ensure that that the leaders are getting on the record, right? Um, that's the accountability that we need to be able to demonstrate that, um, that, uh, you know, we have, we have to get caught fighting and trying and making sure that um, we can be clear about what is getting in the way of us not um, having the, the uh, support that we need. So, so, you know, look, I think that the Women's Health Protection Act is going to be um, a critical tool for us to be able to help tell a story of how we got here and an opportunity for us to, to really lean into as we move into the work in the states, which we know is, is gonna be critical post, um, post June uh, or continue to be, um, that, that we are able to talk about what, what a federal protection actually means and how that is actually gonna transform it. I think there is real power in the agitating moment also. Um, this is an education opportunity as well. There are a lot of folks who I think are tuning into the fight for reproductive rights and access right now as they are seeing the continuing headlines, as they see something like the Texas uh, bill be allowed to take effect and linger and are used to our you know, traditional mechanisms of power, usually the courts backing up that constitutional right. And as those institutions you know, demonstrate their inability to do so, I think that there is, as you say, a real opportunity, perhaps not for passage of the Women's Health Protection Act, if that is, if the votes aren't there, but even then for galvanizing, because no matter if that mm -hmm. passes, no matter what the Supreme Court does, as both of you know, this fight will continue and go on. And so that in and of itself, I think is a real powerful moment and something I know my co-host on the podcast, Imani Gani, and I talk about a lot because we don't wanna be discouraging anybody in this moment, right? This is a long fight and the anti-abortion forces have been in this from the beginning. And so, you know, I just, I don't wanna be discouraging folks, but on that note, we do need to talk about the Supreme Court a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> because the Supreme Court is largely part of the reason why we are here. And so, Michelle, I'm going to turn this to you because we really do need to talk about the court's role in rolling back abortion rights and access. Most recently, by letting SB8 take effect on the shadow docket the way that they did. Your last point, I think, about this being so anti-democratic, it's hard for me to think of anything more anti-democratic in that snapshot than the Supreme Court at the end of August literally sitting on an emergency request to keep the status quo of the law in place, which would have blocked the Texas law, and they failed to do so. So we have that as the backdrop. We're waiting on this decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, which is that Mississippi 15 week ban. What is the role of the Supreme Court in all of this as we sort of assess, but then also I think as we're looking forward, right? Because it's one thing to say what's now, but we have to make progress. And what's the role of the court in there? Well, it's a great question, uh, Jessica, and it flows so well from what uh, Alexis has offered. And look, you know, you'd think I would, that I'm a historian as I just pivot so much to history, but I, I think it's worth noting here that Roe v. Wade was a seven to two opinion and five of those justices were Republican appointed. I say that because I think it's really important to level set for audiences that might say, well, this is just the way that it's always been. And this mm -hmm. is just the way in which the parties always have been. And that's not the case. Justice Blackman, who wrote the opinion in Roe v. Wade, was put on the court by Richard Nixon. So this gives you some sense of how far removed we are, what that space and time of 2010, that trigger year, the people who came into Congress and who came into state offices, how very far apart they were from the history of Democrats and Republicans and the rule of law as associated with 
abortion rights in this country. I mean, it's worth noting that um, Prescott Bush was the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. And I like to remind people that in 1966, Dr. King received an award from Planned Parenthood and wrote a brilliant speech in response to that. Now, Coretta Scott King read that speech in the evening that she read it. She said, I'm so proud to be a woman. I like to sort of joke and say he was off someplace being arrested. But to be clear, he followed up that speech with a letter saying how committed he was to people being able to family plan, how important it was for women, how important it was to see this connection between the women's rights movement and also racial justice and that they came together around family planning. So when we think about the Supreme Court, one of the things that I think that we sometimes don't introduce into this conversation is that the court for a while had been thinking about reproductive autonomy and liberty and what that looked like. A lot of people think that, well, it was just Roe. And sometimes that's an easy kicking point where there are those that say, well, I'm an originalist, I'm a textualist, and, and Roe just came out of nowhere. And they forget um, Skinner v. Oklahoma. Skinner v. Oklahoma, 30 years before Roe v. Wade, where our Supreme Court was talking about it is a fundamental human right to be able to decide your own reproductive destiny. Now, of course, it was a case that involved a man and involved a, a man who, you know, in a state that was seeking to take away his ability to be able to determine his own reproductive future. But the Supreme Court in the most stunning type and clear articulation made very clear that reproductive liberty was very important and belonged to each individual. But where are we now? You know, this question about um, the integrity of the court right now, the court has the lowest popularity poll ranking um, of uh, confidence of the American public than it's had in, in 50 years. People are very concerned about the court. I think it's worth noting that Chief Justice John Roberts, when we're looking at SB8 and that shadow docket, voted with the liberals. In June, Medical v. Rousseau, just a couple years after Whole Woman's Health, um, he voted with the liberals on the court, right? And I think that this was not because the Chief Justice himself necessarily fashions himself as an advocate, as a bold advocate for reproductive health rights and justice, not at all, but he cares about the rule of law and he cares about the legitimacy of the court. And to the extent that we have broadened this conversation, as I believe that we need to, into thinking about voter suppression and voting rights, very recently, just a week or so ago, he voted with the liberals again on a case that involved gerrymandering out of the state of Alabama. And so what the court can do, clearly the court could um, strike down um, this Mississippi law. But I think the question before the court, it's very much worth noting that Mississippi strategically decided to ask for more than just the legitimacy, constitutional legitimacy of the law, but strategically has asked for the court to do all away with Roe v. Wade um, in and of itself. And it's worth noting what the strategy means in light of the court looking differently today with Justice Gorsuch on the court, Justice Kavanaugh on the court, and Justice Barrett on the court. And I think this is something that we should all be concerned about, a court that might blow in the wind depending upon who sits on it and without a real care about what precedent actually means. I could say more, but I want to be mindful of all of the various questions that you have and questions that were put forward by our audience. Well, I am going to give you an opportunity to say more because I want to stick on the court for at least one more question with you because we have a nomination fight um, that we are preparing for. This is a historic moment. President Biden has on his on the campaign trail promised to nominate the first black woman to the Supreme Court. The shortlist indicates that he plans to make good on that promise. This is extremely exciting and important for our country. And I think as we are having this conversation about what the court means, this moment for reproductive autonomy, what does this nomination mean at this time? Well, this is a, a pivotal nomination. So, you know, to be clear, in over 230 years of the establishment of our United States Supreme Court, there's never been a Black woman on the court. Uh, this has been an overwhelmingly, I mean, it, it doesn't even suffice to say an overwhelmingly white male court. Um, it's been a court that, with the exception of uh, just over a handful of justices out of 115 or so, have all been uh, white males on the court. 
Uh, it's been a court in which we've seen two black people on, uh, not at the same time, <laughs> one after the other, uh, one Latina uh, on the court, uh, that's it. If a black woman comes onto the court, and I'm confident that uh, there will be a black woman on the court, um, at that point we will have seen uh, four people of color in total um, ever on our United States Supreme Court. Uh, it's a shameful and alarming uh, record. Um, I will say one other thing about this, but I don't want to actually spend too much time on it, and that is um, the very undignified way in which there have been some that have spoken about the possibility of a Black woman on the Supreme Court using terms of lesser than, less qualified than, in fact, when we don't even know who this person would be, and how alarming that is for all people right now receiving a legal education, and certainly what it means for Black women who are in law schools today. And let's be clear, of the nominees that are the people who are perceived as being potential nominees, they're absolutely outstanding uh, with incredible records. And so, you know, here I would say that there is uh, much to be said about one, jurisprudence in exile. That's the perspective of those that say, well, uh, whomever the next nominee will be and who sits on the court will not have much power, but will be able to write good dissents. Well, there's something to be said about good dissents. I like to think about uh, Justice Harlan and the dissent of Plessy v. Ferguson. Uh, that dissent became basically the rule of law when we got it right uh, in Brown v. Board of Education. But I actually have confidence in the next nominee being able to persuade and influence um, her fellow justices on the court. Um, you know, deliberation is more than what happens after oral arguments or during oral, oral arguments. It really is about shaping um, a dialogue amongst members of the court. And I can't help but think that this will be a court deeply educated by someone coming onto the court who will be bringing um, a broader perspective, a perspective that hasn't been seen on this court. And, and the final point that I'll make, because we're talking about a Black woman serving on the court, it's worth taking a note that as we think about the institutions that have been deeply segregated in our country and that kind of segregation falling away, we saw it with bathrooms, we saw it with schools, we saw it in employment, we saw it in housing, we've yet to see it on our United States Supreme Court. And so I think that this is a moment to take pause about something very positive that's about to happen um, on our court. Um, and the final thing is that we have to pay attention to what happens at the state level. When we think about the Mississippi law and the injunction that's been put in place so that that law is currently not in effect, that law was enjoined by Judge Carlton Reeves, who happens to be a black judge in Mississippi and his uh, order uh, was a stunning order and I commend everyone in the audience to read it, including the footnotes where he called Mississippi out for what he called in his words, gaslighting, uh, and the fact that he could not take seriously Mississippi's claim that anything about its law was about protecting the health and safety of the women in that state. It truly is a piece of stunning judicial writing and I love this. I also think of just the ways in which Justice, Justice Sotomayor's time on the court has already shaped and transformed it. It's and brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. And even during the oral arguments, when the court finally heard oral arguments in this Texas case, she was the only justice zeroing in on the human toll of abortion bans, understanding that there are human beings, that there are lives in this, in these equations, that lawmakers are bandying about all sorts of justifications and intentionally, and she called them out on this, intentionally obfuscating the issue to detract from the human harm. And so for me, as a legal journalist and somebody who, you know, I'm not practicing anymore, just thinking of the elevation of the conversation that that kind of support for Justice Sotomayor and her other colleagues, that is going to change the laws in ways that we, I don't even think on this panel, have the ability to really comprehend right now. And that should be exciting, even as we're talking Absolutely. about very difficult, dark things right now. Jessica, do we deserve her? She's so wonderful. <laughs>
I don't know. I don't know. We, I mean, no, yes, we need her. I don't know if we deserve her. Just, I, but I, Imani and I on Boom Lawyer did an episode dedicated to Sonia Sotomayor many years ago, like three years ago, just because, he, and this was during the Obama years, she was just so on target with that. And the the longer her tenure on the court, I think the, the greater she will reach in that. And, and we see it. And truly, you know, um, the implications are stunning. And I do want to give the Biden administration credit for really making a push on federal judges because we're having this context in the conversation of a Supreme Court nomination. But truly, the Biden administration's judicial nominees across the board have been really excellent and a good answer, in my opinion, as a journalist to uh, efforts by conservatives to really game and politicize the federal courts during previous administrations. And so it is that there's in the media, there's not a lot of oxygen that gets put on those lower court appointments, and they have been really, truly stunning in their own right. So this is an area where the administration deserves some credit. I'm sure the nomination fight is something that Planned Parenthood has some thoughts about, um, if you'd like to share those yeah. as well, Alexis. Uh, no, absolutely. Look, I mean, I agree with everything that Michelle said, and I, I you know, I, I also very firmly believe that the dissent is going to be a really powerful organizing tool, right? Because it, it, it yes. will set the stage for a very long game. And I'm, you know, I will be saying all my hopes and prayers that, you know, the next justice is a powerful um, influencer and persuader and bringing consensus builder in all ways um, in, in the chambers that we don't understand, but we are going to be hanging on to every word of dissent in the same way that, that Sotomayor gives us life, right? I mean, like really helps us articulate the experience and, and being in those courtrooms, you know, like um, during um, the uh, June G case and listening to the um, oral arguments in December, th those questions have been so incredibly pointed because they bring in the lived experience, right? They talk about, I mean, look, we, we are 166 days past um, SB8 going into effect. 100% of patients in our Albuquerque Health Center were from Texas the next day. We know now that the number of abortions have dropped by 60% um, in the next month, right? Which means that more than half people were either traveling out of state or continuing pregnancies against their will. And so it is the, the reality of how we have to grapple with these questions of what does it look like for people who are traveling across state lines um, to be the future you know, state of access. We had one patient um, who uh, was traveling with her boyfriend, who was uh, a, a black man driving across country, driving literally across country in a rental car, gets pulled over by police and doesn't know what to say. You know, which, where am I going? Which, which Planned Parenthood, uh, you know, doesn't really have all of the directions and the information and terrified like that she has to reveal why she is going because at every turn, it's not just gestational week, it's privacy, it's burden, all of these things have been weaponized. And, you know, and I think the, um, the incentive structures that we are seeing in some of these laws um, are, are happening also in real time. We have people in our parking lots who, you know, with cell phone cameras, taking pictures of license tags and pictures of um, a patients and providers going in in case they need to make a case around, um, you know, fighting for this, you know, this bounty, right? That we we still don't understand how it would be uh, enforced and what it would look like. And so I think having a justice in, um, you know, on, on the bench who really can give voice to the, the reality of what it feels like to be, you know, criminalized, uh, the reality of what it looks like to understand um, how uh, patients could be um, you know, um, seen in this moment, just it's, I think it's a really important moment for us to lock in and also make sure that we are um, ensuring that the same justice who's going to also be going through uh, a set of hurdles and barriers where her credentials are going to be challenged, where her, you know, uh, record will be interrogated like all justices are, but will be through a lens that is very specific around uh, demeaning on, on grounds of, of, of race and the kind of intersectional invisibility that, that Black women in particular experience. And so like we have a huge stake in making sure that we are um, enforcing 
having a, a fair process and ensuring that we are making sure that uh, we are fighting um, accusations of discrimination, but we also have to play a critical role in making sure that the, the lived experience is, is coming through in the conversation um, and so that people really understand what's at stake when these folks get on the bench. Thank you so much for sharing some of those anecdotes of what um, your health centers are seeing here in Colorado, um, where I am. I know that um, our uh, clinics and centers are seeing a tremendous uptick as well, and also reporting um, an uptick in harassment in just em emboldened folks and confusion, which is, I think, another thing that um, a lot of these and is part of the, str the strategy behind this onslaught of abortion restriction after abortion restriction after abortion restriction in the state is in part to sow confusion around what our rights really are. And what, you know, one of the most Googled questions, um, and you know, when SB8 was um, debated before it even took effect was, is abortion legal in Texas, right? So people, there really is a sense of confusion and, you know, uh, anxiety around the scope of folks' rights. Um, thank you both for all of this. There, I could do this for four more hours. I won't do that, though, for both of you. Though we have uh, collected several questions from the audience, and they've raised some really interesting points. Um, and I want to save some time to get to them, uh, in part because it's almost as though they anticipated some of our conversation. One of the questions that really stood out to me um, was from an audience member that said, given that, uh, that abortion, quote unquote, procedures are at risk, would this include such procedures around things like miscarriage or care and miscarriage management. And it would, but I want to leave, I want to open the floor up to both of you to really talk about the ways in which abortion bans aren't isolated to just abortion the way that we conventionally think about that. You know, I think it's a great question. So I want to thank the audience member who sent that forward because the attacks that we've seen on reproductive health and rights must be understood as broader than abortion, right? And so that when we're talking about reproductive health rights and justice, we're not just talking about abortion. Abortion is a very important part of looking at a wheel with various spokes on it. And what makes these times so alarming in our country is that on the other side of this very active type of legislating um, to defeat uh, reproductive health and rights happens to be death. The United States has the highest maternal mortality rate in what's called the developed world. And to expand it even beyond that, we're not just talking about Germany, France, Italy, and England, right? We're talking about the U.S. ranking somewhere between 50th and 54th in the world, depending upon what study you're looking at, a maternal mortality rate that's closer to Saudi Arabia, um, and worse than in Bosnia than our peer countries. And I mentioned that because um, as we look at Title 10, which was gutted during the Trump administration that provides for reproductive health care for the poorest of Americans, or we're talking about sex education in school, or we're talking about these very same legislator, legislatures and legislators that are sponsoring it, drafting criminal laws and implicating uh, criminal law within the space of reproductive health. That is enacting laws that embolden police and prosecutors to arrest individuals after miscarriage, after stillbirth, under suspicion that they've done something to harm um, a fetus. And this is so alarming. I mean, this is a world that we had not seen before in the United States. Um, and that is what's alarming. But, you know, when we think about the state of Texas, you know, remember that it's the same state where Marlise Munoz, um, a brain dead person who had an aneurysm at 14 weeks of pregnancy, was forced by the state to gestate um, a fetus that was in demise and that ha had uh, anise that was an anencephalic um, fetus for 62 days while her parents and husband protested to remove her off of this life support, which Texas made her stay on. So it's a great question. And I think there are a whole satellite of issues for which we should be concerned because it's all alarming. It is 
so alarming. And I think even in recent years, right, the, you know, like so much of what we are fighting now is, um, you know, not just an abortion rights, obviously, this is this, this goes broader to kind of the state of democracy, right, is, is just this misinformation, right. And so you have entire campaigns that have been built around straight up lies about abortion, about how our bodies work, about how we function. But those lies then get codified in policies in response to these kind of imagined problems, and it makes the problem seem real. And so when we talk about something like miscarriage, right? I mean, like the first question that I have is like, how do you enforce, you know, um, you know, uh, miscarriage enforcement? And then someone says, oh, we're going to ask uh, all pregnant women to register in a database uh, in the state, and we're going to build a law around that. You know, in 2019 in Missouri, the health director kept a spreadsheet of Planned Parenthood patients periods in order to figure out whether or not they were carrying um, uh, pregnancies to term. Like these, these are the ways the kind of invasion of, um, of, of, of privacy and just basic dignity and decency. I don't even understand like how to like <laughs> come up with words to, to describe how diabolical it is. But, but, but those are the things that I think will be the next, um, you know, frontline because they've been testing the models in order to, to see how, you know, how people will react to them. Absolutely. It's very, it's very scary. I know um, at Rewire News Group, I was interviewing a provider in Texas who was talking about the fact that um, hospitals were so uncertain in the, in the face of SB8 as to what to do, that they were rewriting their own emergency procedures. They were sending patients who were presenting with ectopic pregnancies, which should not even be covered in this Texas ban away because they were unsure about whether or not they could provide care. That is how upside down things are. So this is this is the, you know, the right now. And that point in terms of enforcement of abortion bans is really so right on. You know, whenever I speak about these, particularly in conservative areas, you know, I have a story where I went to to give a, a talk at the University of Arkansas at a gender studies class. And a lot of the students there came from back backgrounds. And so one of the first things I did was say, you know, how many of you have had comprehensive sex ed and nearly nobody raised their hand, right? Mm -hmm. Because I want to know where my audience is when we're talking about these kinds of issues. Otherwise, you know, you don't want to alienate them right out of the gates. But I ask how many of you, you know, know somebody who has had a miscarriage and would you feel comfortable with the sheriff going through your pastor's garbage to determine if that miscarriage was in fact indicia of a crime? And it changes the conversation. And so, I, you know, I, it's not to, you know, try to amplify that scariness necessarily, but this is just the reality. You know, we have a woman in Oklahoma who is serving a jail sentence related to a miscarriage. You know, we have a woman in South Dakota who was sentenced uh, to jail uh, for a pregnancy loss. And the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals borrowed from federal anti-abortion legislation, borrowed the language of it to justify that prosecution. Yeah. So that's that's the landscape that we are at. And, and, I, and I just wanna drive that home for folks who maybe will say like, it can't be that bad or, oh no, they really wouldn't throw women in jail for, for abortions or they wouldn't really go after doctors. And, and they are, they're doing that. Can I just add to that? There's Please. a chapter in my book where I started off uh, with a narrative about a meeting that I was invited to speak at. and. It made me wonder, given this particular group, it's, it's a very conservative group of, of women. And um, I thought, well, I, you know, surely the person who's invited me has told them what I'm going to be speaking about, right? And, um, and I went and you would have thought it was a church revival. I mean, I thought I'd be in and out in the hour. And I was there for three hours with this women, these women who were alarmed. And these were a wealthy group of conservative women, but were deeply alarmed and had their own stories to tell. The difference between them and the women that you've just mentioned are that they have lawyers and that they were right away able to fight back. And, and there were so many hands that went up in the room about, you know, letters from their lawyers about the kinds of things that we're talking about that shut it down. It was really stunning to me. I mean, in a way, not surprising on two fronts, not surprising because of the sweeping way in which our country has become kind of infected by this. And also then not surprising the way in which they were able to distinguish themselves from people who are now incarcerated in that they had the means 
to be able to fight back. And so your point about here this is and to take it seriously is really important. I want to talk a little bit about sort of allies and coalitions and getting people into this fight. Are there organizations, groups, I don't want to put anybody on the spot necessarily, but how can we broaden this umbrella, right? One of the things for me that is so lovely about doing reproductive uh, justice work is the interconnectivity of the issues. Folks who, who see reproductive justice as an issue understand that it is climate justice, that it is voting rights, that it is all of these things. How can we do more of that for the folks who aren't movement people and bring them in? And are there folks who we should be trying to talk to to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think this moment, um, I think one of the things that we have to understand, it may be very surprising for those of us who are like deeply immersed in doing, you know, addressing this issue every day and thinking about it and understanding the impact of a Texas right now and, 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 and pondering um, the, you know, what may happen in um, the decision around Jackson Women's Health. The reality is that while 80% of people want abortion to remain legal, just 33% of voters polled recently believe that Roe is going to be overturned. Like, like think about wow, that. Wow, that disconnect <laughs> blows my mind. Blows <laughs> your mind, right? That like, there is literally no state, not Missouri, not Mississippi, not Texas, that um, where the majority of people believe that, um, you know, that, that lawmakers should be making these decisions, they want the decision to remain in the hands of the person seeking abortion. Um, and yet, like we have been saying the sky is falling because it absolutely is, but people won't believe it until it happens. And, and this, is, this is polling after Texas, right? So we have a legitimate case on the ground that is telling that. So, you know, abortion is essentially outlawed in the second largest state in the country. The majority of sitting Supreme Court justices have said they're totally okay with that. And people still don't think the constitutional right to abortion is gonna be taken away in 22. So that is what we are, that's the prism that we have to like kind of frame, you know, not just um, kind of our support, but like, you know, the movement support, the broader ecosystem, our allies, and then just everyday people who are who are now just waking up and looking at the paper and saying, wait, is something going on that I didn't know about? And I do think that um, from a you know the connection of um, of issues um, that Michelle wove together around voting rights, right? We're we're also looking at all of the other things that could unravel with this thread um, under the Fourteenth Amendment, you know, marriage equality. Like like people are starting to connect those dots. Um, and I think that there, those movement partners are engaging, um, and and yet we still have to do some of some more bridge work to say to to make it real for folks. Like, what does it mean to take a job now in Texas? Uh, what what conversation are we having with our you know corporate partners, um, shareholders, ERGs? You know, engaging in those conversations. What does it look like to send your child to school in a state? That will outlaw like those are the constituencies that I think we haven't you know you know figured out what the umbrella is to be able to to rally and engage in conversations because I do think that our the the partners that traditionally would show up are in line because they've seen it now happening you know on trans rights on voting rights and other things but like how are we actually moving this outside of our kind of um kind of political sphere um movement sphere and into like this is actually what's going to happen when your child is here. This is what, if you're gonna take that job, this is actually, you're gonna to have to fly out if this happens. And what's that gonna look like for you? These are really truly kitchen table issues, right? We talk about the way that like policy changes and abortion is a kitchen table issue in that regard. Um, I know I have been involved in conversations with um, you know, uh, corporate leaders who are very concerned about how to support their employees in the event you know, of a pregnancy that goes sideways and they now have to find a way out of Texas, right? A wanted pregnancy and you find yourself you know, in a difficult situation. Um, yeah, so much, so, so much there. Um, 
One of the things that also gives me hope, although I know that there is great legal risk around it, is the abortion pill, hypocristone. We cannot put that back, that genie back in the bottle. What is the future there? And are you two as hopeful about it as I am? Well, you know, we have to keep in mind um, the North Star and that Roe was never the North Star. Right, shortly after Roe, with the Hyde Amendment and a series of Supreme Court cases that made clear that there would be a distinction between those of means and those without means and the ability to be able to terminate a pregnancy. And so for women who experience low income or, or indigency, this has always been a rather delicate type of an issue. And now we can bring that better front and center. And when we think about Congress, put pressure on Congress uh, with regard to the laws um, and the riders that have been harmful domestically and internationally as mm -hmm. we think about uh, pregnancy termination. So what might a North Star look like? Well, yes, being able to handle one's own abortion and the privacy of one's own home and avoid the harassment that sadly people still experience when they um, go to receive care at a clinic. Certainly that care should still be available, but there are other creative means that we can think about um, that come out of this time. And I think that we need to embrace that. And in fact, I think we need to be even bolder to redefine what does um, a reproductive right look like in the 2022s and beyond, right? What does reproductive justice 2.0 look like? like in this space. And I have a book that I'm going to be working on on reproductive justice 2.0, right? So, so what should the future hold for us? Um, and I think that those are really important questions for us, not to just be saddled with seeing Roe as a North Star. It was a really important decision in 1973, but does it hold up for what it is that we need uh, today? Oh, I love that. Alexis, do you have anything that you want to add? No, I'm I'm like, I'm here for the book. I'm like, I know. I'm like waiting. I was like, wait, what? Um, so yes. I was um, glad I was muted when I was clapping because it was quite loud. <laughs> like all of that. Um, and, um, you know, and also the fact that 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 is also going to be a game changer, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, we should, to your point, give the give the administration credit where credit's due and, you know, lifting the um, rems was, was incredibly important. Wasn't, you know, there, there are all ways which we want to push and, and uh, make sure that they're sending all the full power of the, of the, of the federal government, their whole of government approach. But this was one where I think that um, I think is really important. The reality is there, there are still 19 states that ban, <laughs> restrict the use um, of telehealth for medication abortion. And in a moment, you know, we are, we're still in the third year of a pandemic, you know, like the, like there, there are still um, um, restrictions, and I think to where Michelle named um, the real impact on the people who, um, you know, will be most harmed and consistently harmed by the barriers that exist. These, these will continue to be hurdles. I think what we have to acknowledge, though, um, as a provider, uh, is that you know, it, it is going to change the way in which people think about accessing abortion. And it means that we will have to consider what does it look like um, in a, you know, in a world where people will have to build a, a different knowledge base around what self-medication, um, self-managed abortion looks like, um, where they will have to understand how to evaluate what the, um, you know, what, uh, what, what, medication they are actually getting, right? Because we don't know where we'll all come from and that people will find ways as, as they did before 1973. Um, and so understanding that that is gonna be the reality and making sure that we're doing everything we can to support um, patients, uh, to get them the access and the care that they need and also to make sure that they are you know, fully educated on, on what all of the, the ramifications and possibilities will be. So there is a lot of hope there, but there still is a huge amount of education that has to accompany that in order to make sure that we are protecting um, patients as much as possible. This has just been so fantastic. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. We are creeping up at the end of our hour. Um, so one last question, same question to both of you. What is the best way from your unique vantage points that an individual can help in this fight that's not reliant on the ability to donate money right now? That's a really good question. You know, so I think that um, our call to action, and I realize that folks say it's not about donate money, but even whatever you have, actually, it can be put to a very beneficial uh, use. 
And, you know, I think um, being paying close attention to the struggles for voter equality and voting right is important. Uh, this coming election, if you have the ability uh, to serve as a poll worker, if you have the ability um, to serve as a person who is overseeing in that process, then please do it. Um, if you have the ability to drive people to the polls, then please do it. If you have the ability to be able to communicate and to educate people in this space, then please do it. I think voting rights are absolutely essential to the conversation that we're having. I also think something else essential to this conversation is about the ERA and making sure that it gets its way through Congress. There have been 38 states that have ratified it, and it's time that we have an equal rights amendment in our Constitution. Uh, and a final thing that I'll make, and you know, and I have a laundry list about all of this, um, but I would say that as you look to your left and as you look to your right, the issues that you know concern our nation and a healthy democracy are also the issues that concern us in this space. And so that's LGBTQ justice and equality, and it also means making sure that we're paying attention to immigrants' rights in this country as well. And I'll end it with that. Jessica, thank you so much. You've just been such a wonderful, wonderful host. Oh, thank you so much. This has just truly been a thrill of a career. I could talk to you brilliant women for hours. I hope to have the opportunity to do that one day. That would be really lovely. Thank you both for taking time and sharing your insight with all of us. Um, this has been illuminating. I have learned so much and I do this all the time. I can only imagine how um, it was for the rest of the participants. A big, big thank you to the Beverly Hills uh, Bar Association and Writers Block LA for coordinating this program. Um, and please, and thank you to all of the folks who took time out of your evening today to spend an hour and talk about and listen to this conversation about the state of reproductive rights and access in this country. We talked about some heavy topics, but I just want to say that, you know, consistently as somebody who has been in this in this space and doing this work for over 10 years, you will find folks who are so dedicated to the cause of justice and the long-term fight. And we see two of some of the very best representatives on this panel with us. So thank you again, both for your time. Um, please support their work. If you have not uh, picked up a copy of um, Professor Goodwin's book, Policing the Womb, please do so. It is essential reading um, for what we are uh, living through right now. Thank you all. If you have any other questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, I am at Rewire News Group. Um, if you are a podcast person, feel free to listen to the podcast that I co-host with Amani Gandhi, Boom Lawyered. We take a whack at these issues and try to have a little bit of fun doing so. Thank you all for your time tonight. This has been truly an honor and a pleasure. <laughs>